To remember the planets is going to bring to mind primary, dwarf, and hypothetical planets. And that brings to mind a story. Once upon a time, Sri Krishna and the five Pandava brothers went hunting in the forest. By the time that they had finished the hunt, the sun had gone down and night was about to fall. They realized that they couldn't return to the kingdom that day and decided to spend the night in the forest. A cave was found and it was agreed that each person would stand guard for two hours while the others slept. The youngest brother, Sahadeva, was given the first watch. He sat down at the entrance of the cave, holding all of his weapons aloft, and others went to sleep inside. After an hour and a half, Sadeva suddenly noticed a dwarf coming towards him from the forest. Stop, Sadeva said. Who are you? Where are you going? The dwarf said, You can see that I'm a tiny dwarf. I want to fight you. Sadeva thought, Here is a foot and a half tall dwarf, and here I am, a six-footer. I will win with no difficulty at all. <laughs> oh, Therefore, for the sake of entertainment, he agreed to fight the dwarf. However, this was no ordinary dwarf. He defeated Sahadeva, tied him up with a rope, left him on the ground, and went away. A little later, Nakula woke up. He went out and found Sahadeva missing. He called out to him, and a faint voice replied, I am here. Nakula found him in the state in which the dwarf had left him. Who did this to you? he asked. Sadeva could not bring himself to say that he had lost to a small little dwarf. So he replied, I just felt like tying myself up and resting on the ground. Nakula said, okay, go and sleep inside now. I will keep watch. Towards the end of Nakula's two hours, again the dwarf appeared and the same sequence was repeated. Next was Arjuna's turn. He also found Nakula lying on the ground tied up with a rope. All the brothers faced the same situation, including Bhima and Yudhisthira. Finally, Krishna came out and found Yudhisthira on the ground. Now, Yudhisthira was one who always spoke the truth. He told Krishna the whole story. I don't understand what happened, he said. When my watch was just about to finish, this tiny dwarf appeared from nowhere and said, I want to wrestle you. When we started wrestling, something strange happened. The more I fought, the bigger the dwarf became until he was a huge giant, and I was like a child before him. He easily caught hold of me, threw me on the ground, and tied me up. I am unable to understand what kind of dwarf he was. Krishna smiled and said, Never mind, go and rest. Now that I am awake, I will see to him. And just as dawn was about to break, Krishna saw the dwarf walking towards him. When the fellow was right before him, Krishna asked, what brings you here? The dwarf replied, The same desire with which I came to your five friends and defeated them. I want to wrestle you and fight you. Krishna prepared himself and the two started wrestling. Soon the dwarf began to increase in size. Krishna understood the matter. He threw down his weapons, sat down quietly on the ground and said to the dwarf, You can hit me. At this, the dwarf began to reduce in size. Krishna simply watched him. And finally, when he became so tiny that Krishna could make his move, Krishna tied him up in his pitambri, which is the, the yellow wrap that, uh, that Krishna customarily wears. And then Krishna sat down. And then soon after, all the brothers woke up and came out of the cave. Seeing Krishna, they asked, Did someone come to see you while you stood guard? And Krishna said, oh yes, a tiny little dwarf came. And the brothers asked, so what did you do with him? And Krishna replied, I did nothing. And here he is, tied up in my pitambari. In surprise, the Pandavas asked, what is the meaning of this? When we fought him, he continued to become bigger and bigger and bigger. But you have tied him up in your wrap. And Krishna now told them who the dwarf was. It was anger. Krishna said, anger assumed the form of a dwarf and fought you. And the more you fought the anger before you, the anger within you also rose. This made the anger confronting you bigger and bigger until it became so huge that it completely overpowered you and tied you to the ground. Yudhisthira said, 
Oh, the matter has become clear now. You were the only one who recognized the dwarf for what the dwarf really was. This made the anger confronting you bigger and bigger and bigger. And the more you fought it, the bigger it got. And it overpowered you and tied you to the ground, right? And so by reversing this, he became so small that he became insignificant. So this story is very, very important, particularly at, at this time. I was just thinking of it because of the dwarf uh, logic of stars and so forth. But, um, you know, obviously there's different kinds of stars to think of, etc. Primary, dwarf, hypothetical, etc. But this is a great story using this dwarf logic. And, you know, it means negative qualities in life will always exist. If you try to remove them from your life in a way that involves fighting, struggle, they're just going to get bigger and bigger and bigger and the negativities get stronger and stronger, right? And so if you just simply sit, acknowledge that they're there, and adopt positive qualities, they will shrink. Maybe they'll even go away on their own. They will come, they will become silent and mute. Anyway, I really like that story and it was a nice way to start because we're going to talk about remembering the planets today and turning the planets that we've remembered into a memory palace. Now here we see an image uh, that is supposedly Giordano Bruno looking out behind the known solar system at that time, the known solar system, to imagine all the stars behind this. And we're going to talk a little bit about Giordano Bruno because as you may know, we're working hard on a series from the art of memory and all of his stuff. And <laughs> Bleak Sand says, who needs YouTube notifications when you have luck? Great, great. Well, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad I feel lucky that we're here with you, Bleak Sand. If you're just joining us, hit the thumbs up. Let me know where you are in the world, what you're doing, what you're thinking, and how you're feeling. David says he's in Chicago. It's snowing. Wow. It, in March. Well, I hope you're doing okay there, making some snow memory palaces. I've got something warm to drink in my nice solar system cup to go with today's theme. And so let me know where you are. KL says hello. Let me know how things are going. Have you ever memorized the planets? We're going to talk about it in a couple of different ways. And, um, you know, this book on the shadows of the ideas and other works by Bruno talk a lot about the stars, using the stars as memory palaces, the constellations as memory palaces, symbols from the horoscope and whatever you want to call that stuff as memory palaces. And in the series Art of Memory, I'm talking a lot about how that Bruno is not getting wanting us to memorize those things. But then at the same time, we want to be fair and say, well, what if we did memorize some of those things to help us? And the reason why I say and point out that actually, and in part two of the Art of Memory series, I will show you the quote where Bruno is saying very clearly, these are examples. Make your Go your own way. Make your own stuff. Don't You don't have to memorize what I memorized because I never memorized it. It doesn't say it exactly that way. But all the stars were known to him at his time. This is stuff that you learned in school, right? But the whole point is, is that we can actually try to reproduce this thing. His memory palaces as such. Yeats tries in the art of memory. So we want to go into that. And we want to try to figure out what... Uh, why is this not working here? What the heck is going on in um, images like this? So this is uh, reproduced here very nicely on the inside of this book. We'll show you some more images in the Art of Memory series. By the way, if you haven't seen part one of our Art of Memory series, please make sure to uh, schedule some time to go through it so that part two makes sense for you. The script for part two is, is done. I need to you know edit it a little bit more, make sure it has all the good stuff in it that I want because it has to last for the test of time, but we talk a lot about stars <laughs> in this, using the stars as memory palaces. So I wanted to actually talk about using the stars as memory palaces. So that link is there for you. It's also in the description below. And if you really want to understand the art of memory, you do need to understand something about the stars, what Bruno may have done with them, what uh, all of this is all about. And you don't want to miss part one because when part two comes along, it's going to say, hey, watch part one. Uh, <laughs> that's just the way it works, right? Used to be that knowledge had a little bit more structure than it does these days in uh, the YouTube world, but we're doing the best that we can to keep some of that linear knowledge going, which I hope uh, 
you appreciate if if I am a little bit old fashioned in those <laughs> respects. But uh, foundations and Bruno will tell you again and again and again, master the foundations or go home. He's a little bit more rude than I am. But uh, when I play his character, I'm allowed to be a little bit rude. We're going to talk about rudeness today as well, especially with respect to Saturn, maybe a little bit to Jupiter, because those are useful things. All right. So again, if you're joining us, hit the thumbs up. Let me know where you are in the world, what you're doing, what you're thinking. And KL asks, do you do one-on-one -on -one mentoring? I'm doing it right now, my friends. I am one. You are one. Here we are one together. Reach out for inquiries with that by email. I generally think people should be uh, completing the Magnetic Mary Method Masterclass first, and that's usually how it works best. But um, we've certainly done it the other way around, and uh, I would love to hear from you by email if that's of interest to you. All right, so we're going to talk about acronyms versus acrostics for the planets to memorize them. We're going to talk about memorizing them in an order, whichever order it is that you want. We're going to talk about specific mnemonic devices for the planets, and then we're going to make a memory palace from the planets. Isn't that exciting? If you're excited, hit that thumbs up. Let me know where you are in the world, what you're doing, what you're thinking. Get engaged. This is your opportunity. You know, KL is asking if I'm doing one-on-one -on -one mentoring. Now's the time for some when on when mentoring. So pop your questions anytime into the chat. Catch up with as many as we can. I know sometimes I don't see them properly, etc. as we go through these live streams, but it is your chance to ask anything that you want. And uh, yes, there is a value to being one-on-one, -on -one, just you and I. In uh, And I've seen it many, many times. It helps a certain kind of people, and I do do it very happily when it's a fit and when, when people legitimately need that that assistance and are able to make it work for themselves. Uh, but another thing that you can do is get the pre-order of the Kindle of Victorious Mind. And the Victorious Mind has a theme in it, which is how to become your own teacher, how to not need teachers anymore. Now, we will always want teachers. We will always need teachers. It's not saying that, but it is about self-resilience. It's about answering the question of the teacher in many, many ways. And yeah, you'll, you'll see it in the conclusion, how it all ties together. Because, you know, books have conclusions that tie things together, which we'll talk about in part two of our Art of Memory series, how important that is for using the memory tradition. By the way, I'm using a straw these days because I got medicine on my lips that I can't quite swallow. So <laughs> I know it looks corny, but <laughs> it's also quite fun. I feel like a kid again. All right. John Boy is taking a sabbatical, a sabbatical at home. And enjoying more memory palaces. Excellent, John Boy. I haven't seen your your name or your your image there for a long time. Good to see you again. Thanks for being here. Thanks for saying hello. So here's the deal. I feel a bit awkward about exactly what to do with the launch of the new book. It's scheduled for the print and the audio and everything to be released on uh, April 30th. I'm not sure, you know, if that should be delayed or not given the time. But you can still pre-order if you want. And for people who pre-order and send their receipt, I have a special course for you called How to Stop Thinking. That's already gone out to the first students. You should have received the first email from that now. And um, in that course, there's a way to get the audio book in advance as well. Uh, just as soon as I have your receipt and you get that first course email, you'll have an opportunity to get the audio book in advance. But um, again, I'm not sure what's right in terms of you know, the marketing shtick and everything like that. And even in How to Stop Thinking, one of the first lessons I talk about that because it produces thoughts. And then we have to deal with the thoughts. So how do we get the thoughts to go away? Well, one thing that you do is you just call a spade a spade, which I'm doing right now. And then the thoughts start to disappear. And there are a lot of tools in this book and in the free course about how to make your thoughts disappear. And uh, so that's there for you. Just a little sort of light thing. If you had gone to be part of the street team, that's all over now. That book directs you, or this link uh, goes directly to uh, Amazon in your country, or it should. Now, in terms of the marketing stuff, memory and marketing have gone together for a very, very long time. Jordana Bruno was a master of it. There were many, many other masters before that, and it's just always gone together. A lot of people, they're like, ah, there's nothing new, and, and then they get all uh, their knickers in a twist about people making new memory books and yada, yada, yada. Like, it just goes on and on and on. Well, the reality is, is when we have situations like this, there are a lot of people who are desperate. Their restaurants can't get customers. Their gyms, people are closing memberships like crazy. And um, Jonathan Levy and I, we're very good friends. One thing that we want to do for people 
who have any interest in business whatsoever in doing online content in order to help others and, you know, just have a life, uh, whatever. If you're interested in business at all, I'll pop this on the screen for you. It'd be lovely if you join us. We're going to dive deep into how to create killer digital content and courses. This is scheduled for uh, not 4.30 a.m. It's just showing that for me here in Brisbane. Yes, I'm going to get up early to help people. We're going to dive deep into what we know. If you don't know Jonathan Levy from Super Learner, please check him out. Please go there, click that you're interested so that you're notified when we go live. It'll be at a different time for different people in the world, but we just want to help as many people as we can learn what we do, how we use the internet to reach people, to teach people. Most of what we do is free and uh, it works because it just always has. If you have something that is worth sharing with the world, then the world will take care of you. It's a, it's a, it's a strange thing, the way that it works. And it's not exactly that phrase, you know, that uh, if you can give a million people what they want, you'll get what you want. It's actually a little bit different. It's more about not wanting things, which is why <laughs> The Victorious Mind is is an interesting book to be releasing at this time, to release yourself from desire, to release yourself from wanting anything so that you extrovert your attention, so to speak, on just serving the world and you have bliss every minute. Anyway, if you want to have an online business or you have one now and you want to be doing better, this free training is taking place. Just tell Facebook if you're a Facebook person that you're interested. I'm sorry we don't really have a way to shoot it all over to different platforms. Some people hate Facebook. I would just suggest get over your hatred. Those are just thoughts. Let them go. All right. So with all that said, thanks for being here. Hit that thumbs up. Let me know if you have questions about any of these things we talked about so far. And let's talk about planets. So the first thing that's going to come up is, well, you know, what do we do about Pluto? What do we do about Planet X or whatever? Let's just say that whatever your opinions, your thoughts, your beliefs, perhaps your fantasies about the status of what is a planet, what isn't a planet, etc. Let's just work with these from NASA and and uh, just leave the Pluto question out of out of things or maybe not. It's up to you. I mean, we've got it here in some senses. We don't have it in others. But, you know, let's just work with the primary planets to keep it simple, to keep it fun, to keep it direct. And if you want to throw that in there, well, then you could do an acronym, you know, but this is not a very sensible acronym. MVEM just some, right? That's not exactly what I would want to work with. But if you were going to do that that way, you know, what would you do? Maybe you want to get interactive right now and engage and leave some ideas in the discussion. That's up to you. The uh, online acronym uh, finder, or uh, better said, an anagram finder that I used only came up with one solution. June MVP Miss. So... June is the most valuable person and she's a missus or something like that, right? It's, it's not really quite getting there, right? Uh, but the way that a lot of people do it, and you'll find this if you search the Googles, is my very educated mother just served us noodles. And we could think about variations for this. And it's, you know, it's a bit of a challenge. It's a great brain exercise. So, you know, I don't know. I'm not sure what what would be better than this. How would we... How would we up the ante? David says, my very eager mother just served us nine pickles. That's uh, actually, you did it. You did it. You upped the ante. So thumbs up to David if you haven't thumbsed up yet. Thumbs up in the chat. Um, let's uh, let's super chat David. We could send that directly on over to him. By the way, thanks to our channel members. I really, really appreciate the people who are signing up to support the program. And um, that's, uh, yeah, I'm just super grateful for that. And one of these days, what we'll do when the, when there's a, then there, when there's enough of them, we'll have a, a live stream and, and memorize them all and talk about memorizing screen names, which are more challenging than names in, in many cases. And thanks to everybody too who joined the name them all uh, program uh, that's uh, in full swing right now. Hope you're having fun if you're in it. David says that's from grade school. All right, yeah, I I, I think that in grade school we had something around pizzas, but that's because Pluto was a planet when I was in grade school. In any case, whether you're using an acronym or an acrostic, which, oh, by the way, um, my very educated mother just served us noodles, or David's suggestion here, my very eager mother just served us nine pickles, those are, that's not really an acronym. I believe that's an acrostic. So an acrostic is when you take a bunch of letters and you fill in 
uh, words. And it doesn't have to be individual words, but it could be a poem that's built from uh, an acronym, essentially, that is laid out in a, hor uh, a vertical fashion. Maybe you could do it horizontally, too, in a certain way. Hmm. That's interesting to think about, isn't it? <laughs> All right. Now, whether you're going to use an acronym or an acrostic, you know, you might want to think about how you can lay this out in a memory palace. And we're going to talk about how to solve this because things like my, you know, my very, very, what's an image for very? That can be quite challenging. So quite frankly, I think that acronyms and acrostics for things like planets, it just doesn't, it doesn't really make sense in my view. What do you think? I think that we can refine this. I think we can do a lot better. And I think we can do it in a way that allows us to turn what we do to memorize the order of the planets into a memory palace. Not only do I think that we can do it, where am I? Where's my ego? I know we can do it. Um, <laughs> I'm looking for my ego here. Where are you? Nope, nowhere in sight. All right. Um, the thing is, I know we can, even if you don't say we can. Nori is here. Good to see you from Manila in the Philippines. How are you keeping over there? Thanks for joining us. If you're joining us, hit the thumbs up. Let me know where you are in the world, what you're doing, what you're thinking. Now, before that we start to make a memory palace that will help us memorize the order of the planets and become a memory palace that will help us memorize other things, let's talk about mnemonic devices for the planets. And this, talk, this requires a little bit of discussion of Ars Combinatoria. So without diving too deep into Ars Combinatoria, it is sort of hidden, lost. It's in here, lull, lully. Some people would maybe think that it should be pronounced you or you. Um, and anyway, Bruno was fascinated apparently with this guy. I don't know, when he was before the Inquisition, he let slip uh, some contradictions around this. And it's very difficult to understand what these people are doing. We don't have a time machine to go back and talk to them. We have to sort of reconstruct it almost in the way that you would reconstruct the pyramids, right? Like, you just... Whatever you do, it's not going to be the way they did it. It's just not. Uh, at least, not that I can imagine. And you have to really think deep and hard about what they're talking about. What they're talking about. But I think uh, we managed to get there quite well. Lynn Kelly explains it, I think, very, very well. I don't know why so many nemesis leave it behind. It's the most powerful, the most direct thing to learn and study. So just in a purely example-based way, how it would work is something like this. Now, you want to be prepared. This is why you need to take the free course at magneticmerrymethod.com forward slash YT. And, uh, you know, if you, want to, if you want to understand what this is all about, in the Art of Memory series, we're going to figure this out. But the thing is, Yates didn't understand it. I don't think she understood even the beginnings of the implications of it. Um, uh, uh, GAG is asking, are you adding the Bruno material to the masterclass? The, the thing is, uh, the Magnetic Memory Method masterclass has always been this. That's what it's always been. I just don't complicate it. I make it so simple. And I'm going to prove to you that that's what it's been. That's what the Art of Memory series is all about. This is what the Magnetic Memory Method... I mean, the Magnetic Memory Method is, is, is this plus. It's plus contemporary neuroscience. It's Stephen Costlin's findings in the case for mental imagery. It's certain things that so many people just don't notice in Summa Theologica by Thomas Aquinas. It's things that people don't notice and Yates didn't notice. She didn't pick this out from Rhetorica ad Herenium. Now, I don't want to be on a high horse or sound arrogant or anything like that, but the thing is that we have, I mean, this is, this is one of the reasons. This is, now I sound arrogant, but this is one of the reasons Tony gave me this, Tony Buzan gave me this Warrior of the Mind emblem for outstanding contributions to global mental literacy is because we need to know what Bruno said, but we need to not make it so complicated, not make it so strange, make it more direct. So in a way we have to hide Bruno. But now that Bruno has been unpacked and added to contemporary science, all of the, all of the things, I mean, John Graham, 2018 USA Memory Champion. He wrote a lovely review for my next book and and he sort of talks about the kinds of ways that this has happened. And I'm really honored by it. I don't have it here, but
but um, I have to add it to the Amazon page. I'm just super honored that he that he wrote it in the way that he did because this is this is what's happening uh, with the magnetic Mary method is it's been working and always has had this material that you're asking. You've always had it. It's just clarified to the best of my ability and added with the best of contemporary neuroscience and the best of what the what the competition people know. And so when John and I, John and I are going to do a YouTube collaboration. And one of the things that we were talking about was was this. And he said, you just clarified exactly the way I think of this in the most direct language, in the most simple way. And he's been using ours combinatoria as well. There, Look, let's just put it this way. There, there really probably is no other way for anybody to achieve the highest possible level except through ours combinatoria. The problem is, the issue is, is that, and you see this in a lot of realms. You see this in sports, you see it in screenwriting. I've seen it personally in all these areas. Is there's something called coach effect. And the coach effect is that sometimes the people who only sort of, uh, you know, uh, have these have these incredible performances, they understand how to explain it because they've had something like those performances. So for example, when I was a, a, a story consultant, it always sort of amazed me in that world how that the best story consultants, they are so laser focused on how to make stories better, but they couldn't write a screenplay to save their lives. Like you just don't, you just don't hear about story consultants having amazing screenplays, but they'll get paid a million bucks to tell you what to do to fix one because they're mechanics right? They're story mechanics. They understand it so deeply, but ask them to write one, good luck. Same thing with sports. There's coaches who can get you to throw the ball and sink it, put it in the, put the puck in the net, whatever, right? Just uh, in the goal, what is that what it's called in, uh, in hockey, a net? I'm not sure. But in any case, it, you know, they, they are just experts at getting performance out of people. And so this is, this is also in the memory world. Uh, and, and so we have to think about it that way. Anyway, it's um, interesting what John said, and I'm looking forward to collaborating with him. And just to answer your question, AG, all that the masterclass is is a constant refinement of how to bring this into contemporary science to get rid of the stuff that's in it that doesn't work, which is so sad with Bruno because he was never saying, do this. He was saying, you can't do this, but you must do something like this in your own mind. It's just, it's a little complicated, I admit. But uh, when, when you wrap your head around it and you just go, you just do it, you don't think about it, it all comes clear. And then if you become a person who can explain it, then, then, then you have a nice uh, a career ahead of you, uh, for sure. Because we need more people to help us teach this tradition. So join Jonathan Levy and I uh, when we teach people about how to teach online uh, on our free session later this week on YouTube. So there's that link again for you. Please just click that you're interested. You'll be notified when we go live to teach how to teach online. And it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting topic, teaching memory. Different people teach it different ways and we need more people teaching it different ways. Even though that will make a bit of confusion here and there, we, <laughs> we're getting to a clarity. We're getting to a clarity and it's so beautiful what's happening. We need more of us and we need more of us getting together. All right, so back to the point. I hope that answers your question, AG. Mercury, what are we going to do? How do we use ours combinatoria to make this work? Now, a lot of people, they're going to go, oh, gee, I don't know. But if you've done the work, if you've done the homework, if you've done the exercises, bam, Merlin. It's just that fast, right? Bam, uh, Mary Curie, right? Madame Curie. Now, maybe they're working on a cure. Mercury. It's just that simple. It's go and it's got to be that fast. How do you get that fast? Not by reinventing the wheel, but by using the wheel. But it doesn't have to be a wheel. That's the thing. And Bruno says it loud and clear. It's just hard to see. It's hard to read in here. Don't rebuild the wheel. Don't reinvent the wheel. He says it. But if you use that, just like that, the images will come. All right? So get the free course at magneticmerrymethod.com forward slash YT. Begin to learn how this is really done. Skip ahead. Don't puzzle over it. Get the training. Another example, Venus. I'm your Venus. I'm your fire. What's your desire? Bam. It's just that fast, right? But it's fast. Why? Because of the preparation, because of the exercise, 
and because I put it on a slide. <laughs> but you, you obviously are not going to want to put this on slides. But when you're walking into a room and memorizing all the names of people you never met before, it's the same principle. It's got to be that fast. When you're going and giving a presentation, memorizing a talk, you want to be able to memorize your talk pretty much that fast. Now, talks are different. It's going to be a little bit slow, but it's going to be that same thing in your mind. Every word, every sentence, every quote, just tick, 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 tick. It just doesn't have to be a circle. And in fact, that's one of the most inefficient ways to do it. We're not even sure that Bruno did it that way himself, but he's giving illustrations, examples of how it might work. I'm not, I don't, I don't really think any of them did that. And the reason why I don't think any of them did it with circles and so forth is because anybody who reads the actual text and understands it knows that there are no circles. There are only what appears in consciousness and how that you arrange it for yourself. So stick around for part two of the Art of Memory video. I'll make that a little bit more clear with a prepared script. Earth. Well, who has an ear? Can you see the art of combination going on? Einstein has an ear. Now he's doing this, but you could imagine him, you know, doing that while he's pushing his ear forward, right? Now, Mars, Mars bars can come to mind, but of course also Martians can come to mind. Maybe Marvin the Martian, which we can't use an image of because we don't want to get uh, all kinds of trouble happening with the um, robots reading our screen, but um, you know, boom. Martians. So simple, right? It's art of combination. And if you know Marvin the Martian, if you can hear his voice, all the better. William is joining us. Thanks for joining us, William. Good to see you. Thanks for being here. If you're just joining us, hit the thumbs up. Let me know where you are in the world, what you're doing, what you're thinking. Any questions you have, pop them in the chat. Now is the time. Mmm, straw time. How about Jupiter? Now, there's a lot of things you could do here. One-to-one -one correspondences are pretty pretty close. I mean, juniper berries, is that what they're called? Juniper berries? Now, juniper is not Jupiter. But if you know Amphitryon, uh, which was by Plautus, if memory serves, then you know that, that, that Jupiter comes down to impregnate Alcmene. And of course, Alcmene's child is Heracles. And this is the story of the virgin birth many, many years previous to the story of the other virgin birth, right? So that's a one-to-one -one correspondence. I encourage you to go read uh, Amphitryon by, by Plautus. I, I seem to remember when I read it, it was called Amphitryo, but maybe that's just how he's named in the play. Anyway, it's a gorgeous play. It's a beautiful play. Marsha Brady. Ha, ah, good one, David. Yeah, I remember that. The Brady Bunch. Right. Is there a Marsha in the Partridge family also? No, I, oh, I don't know. I can't remember. The, those shows are blurred in my mind. In any case, yeah, the Brady Bunch. That's a good one. Um, now, why is that happening for David? I'll bet you any money and he can confirm. It's because he's done the exercises. Just like that. You want to make it as fast as you can. Not because you're inventing it in the moment, but because you've prepared to be prepared in the moment. This is the lesson here. Doesn't have to be wheels. But you can you can build the wheel if you want. It's not about the wheel though. You got to understand this. It's about what you did, and how you did it, and uh, used a little bit of Genshi Genbutsu, as they say. Real place, real real you going to the real place to find out and see. All right. So how about another example? Saturn, right? So I think of something close like sad, right? But also. Um, what, what was his name? Saturninus or something like that. Um, but a very Saturnine character. It's close enough. So even though this is Titus Andronicus by Shakespeare, I can't quite think of his exact name. Saturn, Saturninus, I think it's something like that. But he's a Saturnine character. You could use the adjective Saturnine. Maybe that's what his name was in that play. But even when you don't remember things exactly, knowledge of literature is very, very useful for Ars Combinatoria, the art of combination. So he's a Saturnine guy. He's not Saturn himself, but you could think of him and uh, maybe go and refresh your memory of what his name is. And if you haven't read Titus Andronicus or you haven't seen, what, who is it, Julie Taymor? Is that her name, the director? I think that's the director of the movie. If you haven't seen Titus Andronicus, Anthony Hopkins plays Titus. 
This movie will blow your mind. It is so rich, so beautiful, so dramatic, so wonderful for being a nemonist, for using memory techniques. It will blow your mind. It's just that good. Unbelievable. It's so beautiful. Put the subtitles on uh, so that you can read it. Oh, the language is glorious. How about Uranus? Well, I know that a lot of people are going to make nasty jokes about that in their minds. And if not, maybe you should. Not on the screen, though, please. Um, but I didn't think of anything dirty like that. I thought of Uri Geller, right? So Uri Geller is a great example of mnemonic imagery. Why? Because he's so larger than life and so filled with conflicting emotions, right? He's, um, he's really great, but... You know, yeah, you, 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 you can have cognitive dissonance with a guy like him, which makes him perfect for your memory work, right? So what is he doing? Maybe he's, he's um, burning something like the flag of a certain country, or maybe he's at Toys R Us with his little spoons. Think it through. Think it through. Art of combination. What about Neptune? Well, this is kind of a challenging thing. Like, are you going to think about a conceptual abstraction like nepotism? Maybe. Maybe uh, that brings something to mind. If I think of nepotism, the first thing that comes to mind is Christian Bale, because in Batman and the, uh, the series where he played Batman, there's a bit of a sense of nepotism in that movie because of him, you know, Wayne Enterprise or whatever the company is called. You know, he just sort of waltzes in and the boardroom is angry at him and there's some nepotism there. Neptune, of course, a great idea. But what about also Nebuchadnezzar? We can also think of, isn't it, isn't it in the Matrix that the ship is called the Nebuchadnezzar? Or the Nebuchadnezzar? I'm not even sure I exactly say that word, Nebuchadnezzar. But um, lots of things. And Neptune is, of course, a very good suggestion. And those of you who know um, some of the work that I'm doing, that might uh, ring a bell as well. Uh, AG says, what if you don't have a dirty mind? Well, that's probably for the best. And a lot of people do ask that. Uh, Nelson Dulles and I, we talked a long time ago, many years ago, on the podcast, on the Magnetic Memory Method podcast about this. It was our first discussion, if memory serves. It's well worth listening to, uh, the cost of having a dirty mind. In The Victorious Mind, I talk a lot about this issue. And I don't know exactly how to solve it. But if you don't have a dirty mind and you don't want one, then go into the Magnetic Memory Method Masterclass. Go into the training on the magnetic modes. If you can listen to more often, all the better. This will train you to come up with alternatives. And everybody I know who does this says it just changes their life. They, um, they refer to it quite frequently. But the, the, the trick is, is you got to entrain yourself for long enough, frequently enough, in order to get the effect. I myself do this. I, am a, I ended a three-month thing where I did a minimum of four times a week. I usually did six to seven times a week. But I listened to two audios in particular for three months to entrain myself in a particular way of thinking. And I've decided that I'm just going to continue listening to these audios because it's so powerful. The frequency is so powerful. And you know what else? If you have frequency in a state of relaxation and you allow yourself to have a spirit of experimentation in everything you do, and you just allow yourself to be endlessly entertained by the world, bam, you'll be free. Understand what I just said, F-R-E-E, -E, Frequent Practice, State of Relaxation, Spirit of Experimentation, and Entertainment. Mind blown. You will be free. Just follow those rules. The rules will set you free. <laughs> Beautiful. And uh, that again reminds me of when I got this from Tony Buzan, because he had said, the rules will set you free. And I spent so much of my time, so much uh, of my life thinking about this. Well, yeah, okay, the rules will set you free, but what are the rules? And then I thought, well, these fun little acronyms are so fun. So that's what I came up with because those are the neurochemical rules for making sure that you can conquer any goal. You've got to practice frequently. You've got to be relaxed about it. You have to have a spirit of experimentation because nobody gets to control the next minute, let alone the next year. And you got to be entertained, <laughs> right? And what that will do is it will get inside of your brain that garden of wonderful structures I don't know the names of all of them, but I know the names of some of them. What happens is you need dopamine and you need myelin and you need your opioid receptors all firing. And the myelin sheaths, they uh, wrap around the end of your synapses to tighten those connections. Or so it looks in the pictures that the scientists take. 
and then that helps improve the flow of positive and negative ions through the synapses, right? Um, so the synapses, I believe, never actually touch, but at the end of the neurons there, there's all these dendritic spines coming off of there, and oh, it's just a beautiful thing. And then apparently this myelin wraps around it, improving the, po the flow of these positive and negative ions as they fire around. So you want to remember things better. Zoom! The speed comes from frequent practice, relaxation, experimenting in everything in life, letting go of outcomes is what that means, not getting, you know, hurt when you make a mistake, but rather just curious. Whoa, what went wrong there? And then when you do something great, you know, you pat yourself on the shoulder. Wow, that was amazing. I'm so great, which you are. But, you know, you just pause and say, well, what went right there? Experiment with it. Oh, I'm going to experiment more with that stuff. And then entertainment. When you do your exercises, you'll be entertained all the time. How often should you do your exercises? Well, those who are in the master class, at least four times a year. Four times a year, go through the tools that help you practice preparation on the exercises page there at least four times a year, please, in order to do this. All right, so Nebuchadnezzar and uh, Neptune uh, uh, himself, <laughs> King Neptune. Um, John Boy says, nepotistic tuna, Neptune up. <laughs> I love that. And David says, take a nap using tuna as a pillow. Beautiful, beautiful, wonderful. Love that. Thank you for that. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. All right. Now, who would like to know how we could make a memory palace of the planets. Let me know in the chat. I'm gonna get myself a little drink here. And uh, I'd love to know what you uh, what you think. Because Yates does suggest a way to do it. Essentially what she does is she takes this sort of layout and she turns it into a big circle. Uh, a, a circle that's a lot more detailed than this. I don't think you need to do it that way. I don't think you need to make it anything even remotely complex like that. But let me know in the chat if you would like to see a starter uh, version of how we can do this. David says, yes, excellent. Thank you always, David, for your wonderful interest and support. Um, if you want to see more about this, if you haven't already, bookmark for later or uh, join us later, whatever. Watch uh, part one of The Art of Memory. Obviously, these... Um, these videos are, and th thank you, by the way, for everybody who's gotten a copy of Art of Memory. I know that Chrome Woman Walking has been reading along, and uh, she said that it's given her some ideas to help unlock her practice. I'm pretty confident that that will be the case for you as well. Uh, the Art of Memory will help you unlock this on the Shadows of the Ideas, which is very, very challenging. It'll help you understand 30 uh, seals and, you know, all, all, all I don't know, the best uh, ways to translate the titles of all these books. But it'll, it'll really deepen you and connect you with the tradition so much more. And there's no perfect entry point. But even though Yates makes these errors that are quite astonishing, it's still so useful. It's so valuable. And the reason why is because it opens a discourse. It helps you ask questions that you probably haven't thought of asking before. It helps you look in directions. And that's what happened to me, which we'll talk about in part two of The Art of Memory. So for David, we will proceed. But let me know in the chat where you are, what's going on. Hit that thumbs up. Get engaged. This is your chance to ask any questions if you got any. And so a memory palace of the planets could be just as simple as this, right? So, does anybody remember what this was? Let me know in the chat. Mm. <laughs> Test time. <laughs> All right, so obviously that's Merlin, and Merlin was with Madame Curie, so there were, they were working on a cure, if I remember, so that must then mean that we have Mercury, right? So where should Mercury be? Well, why not right there in a memory palace, right? Very, very simple. Now, if you turn that into an, what I think of as an eternal station, then any time you needed assistance to help you remember something, you have imagery ready to go. Now, is this the best way to do it? Maybe, maybe not. Do you have to fire off that imagery? Not necessarily. In the Magnetic Memory Method Masterclass, I give you better ways to, to think about this, to do this. And there's some drills in the card memorization course based on this thinking. All right. Uh, one of the things that I'm doing maybe to end off the month is maybe doing major system mastery again for people. And I might throw on a private live stream to go through some of this 
uh, for people who are very, very serious about that. So let me know if you're interested in that. Um, not sure yet if I'm going to do it. But I was thinking that numbers might be a good thing for us to get all up to speed on. Because during times like these, you know, so many people, they probably don't know how to call their loved ones. If they're, if they're ill and they can't, you know, their battery runs out because they forgot to charge it and they don't know how to use a cell phone, or sorry, a street phone, or they don't know how to tell a nurse at a nursing station what their number is. And uh, so, you know, I had other plans, but it might be that I do that because I think it's one way to, to really, really help people um, during these times. Anyway, let me know if you have any thoughts about that, if you're interested in memorizing numbers, because numbers will apply to, I think, a much better pre-prepared set of images for any um, memory palace. But in any case, carrying on, Venus, of course, we have next, and then Earth with Einstein. We had a Martian, right, to help us remember Mars. And then we can just go to another room. If you know certain other things to do with memory palaces, all this could easily be in the same room, of course. Um, then we had our... Um, our juniper berries for Jupiter, but we also could just go directly to Jupiter, particularly if we know what he looks like in paintings. But if you don't, look, you don't have to have one-to-one -one correspondences, which is why I'm giving the example of juniper here. The whole point with art of combination and memory techniques is you just get something going because you're prepared. And then the beauty is, is that when you go, oh yeah, Jupiter could be Jupiter. Well, then now you just have a much more direct one-to-one -one correspondence, right? And um, in this case, that sound doesn't come up all that often. Uh, jupe. So you could use a jeep, though, right? And that jeep could be filled with or driven by Jupiter, or it could be filled with uh, these berries, right? Uh, which I believe are called juniper berries from a juniper tree, uh, something like that, right? All right. Now we have um, Saturn, of course, next. Sad. And then we could have Saturninus. That's what his name was in Shakespeare. I knew it would come to me. I'm pretty sure it's Saturninus. Saturninus, who is Saturnine. Anyway, um, that's there. And then, of course, we have um, Uranus. And for that, what did I have? Oh, Uri Geller, right. So Uri Geller. And then um, we had a number of nice ideas from you all for Neptune. <laughs> I should have thought of just Neptune. But, of course, we have Nebuchadnezzar. So that's um, a lot of fun and very simple. And if you memorize the planets in memory palaces, one memory palace, two memory palaces, or whatever, and you just store that as a t a t an eternal memory palace that you're going to use for the rest of your life, well, then if you want to memorize some more stuff, you've got images to work with to tie together. Again, I don't think it's that, uh, that streamlined. I think there's better ways to do it, and I explain what those better ways are in different places in the Magnetic Memory Method Masterclass, and one of the most interesting ways, which is, you know, not everybody's going to be interested in memorizing playing cards, but I hope that I encourage you to learn how to memorize playing cards. Why? Because it's one of the most powerful skills that will open you up to all kinds of other insights for which there may not be direct words. And so in there are some exercises that really help you think about having images for your stations in a particular way in order to always have something to go with. And then it can go all the way up to uh, the hundreds if you really want. And there's ways to do that. All right. So... Let's um, let's see. What else do we have to say? That's how I would suggest that you remember the planets and turn them into a memory palace. I don't think acronyms or acrostics are, are the best way. I think they're a bit sloppy. But if you're going to use them, think of how you could lay them out over a memory palace journey. And um, yeah, let me know if you have any questions about these things. I'm wondering if I have a feeling to uh, to read some Bruno or not. Let me know who would like to have a reading from Bruno. If none, then not. If some and enough, then so. <laughs> I'm just I'm just not I'm not a great uh, street magician for uh, <laughs> for for getting action from people. But there is the eighty twenty rule. We don't we don't get our thoughts involved uh, at all because that would be torture. Where are we here? All right, so for those who are late to the game, I would love for you to see part one of The Art of Memory by Francis Yates. There's that link for you. Sublimation Eater, we have one for Bruno. Can we get another one? 
if if not, then uh, you you know watch part one there. I also for those of you who you know would love to get some online business stuff sorted for yourself or improve what you have, Jonathan Levy and I are offering later this week a training. Just go over to Facebook. There's the link for you. Let us know that you would like to join us by saying you're interested, and you'll be notified. And um, yeah, the the last thing that I will say, David is into it. Me too. Can we get a third? Here, sweet, 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 sweet. No, that's um, that's an auction. How do you how do you do this? The magicians, the street magicians, are so good at uh, getting engagement. I got I got to go to like engagement class. <laughs> <laughs> just to get you guys to raise your hands. Who would like a reading from Bruno? Let me know. And uh, finally, the Victorious Mind pre-sale for Kindle is available. Thank you to everybody who has been getting that. If you get it, send me a receipt as soon as possible. I will send you a course that's already set up called How to Stop Thinking. It lets you have some activities to do while you're waiting for the Amazon to send it to your Kindle device. The print is in the works. The audiobook is in the works. You, there's a way, if you have How to Stop Thinking, to get the audiobook early as well. Yes, these are all little roller coaster games using automation and so forth. But if you're interested in how all that works, join Jonathan and I for our talk about online content and why we do some of these things, etc. I know that it's it feels a little bit like not the right time for all these things, but then at the same time, this book is meant to design to make more mental strength for people to deal with times like these. Lots of thoughts come during times like these, what's right, what's wrong, etc., and then to quiet those thoughts. So um, let me know if you have thoughts about what's right or what's wrong. I, I really don't know the answer. And quite frankly, I never know the answer, what's right or wrong. But we don't have free will, at least as far as I can see, which we talk about in this book, how to deal with the absence of free will, how to stop thinking that you're responsible for all the things that are going on, stop punishing yourself. It's, it's really quite detailed um, in, in how that we can unweave this. I only wrote it because it worked for me. And I only ever teach from things that work for me. Uh, and I wish that more people would have that ethic. So it's there for you, whether it's the time or not, I don't know, but... Um, I've been uh, mind mapping about it, etc. Doing some exercises. Uh, I don't know if you know Yannick Silver and his Cosmic Journal. Let me show it to you. He uh, he did this wonderful Cosmic Journal. I've shown it to you before, and uh, you know, completing today's exercise it really helped. It's just it's just filled with all kinds of interesting exercises. So the digital alarm clock, and then you respond. I always respond in a mind map because I want to keep this, because this is a special limited edition. You can't get it. Well, actually, I think he was saying today on our special session, because he's doing an 11-day uh, challenge there. Um, I think he said today that you can still get them, which should be at CosmicJournal.com. And uh, anyway, he's really cool, and he has all these exercises, and so I was completing them, and it just kind of helps you deal with your thoughts, and it's another way to reduce your thoughts through journaling. And uh, I just really love this. I love this a lot. It's very helpful. And it's so wonderful that he's doing this 11-day challenge. And I think if you go to Cosmic Journal and you get one, then you know you could email and say, hey, can I get in this group? We were already three days in of the 11-day challenge, but now's the time, right? Never too late. All right. So incredible developer is curious. AG would love it. All right. So let's, uh, let's do a little Bruno, shall, shall we? I think that this is one of the most important texts in the world. And it's a little bit complicated in part two of The Art of Memory. I'm going to make it a little bit simpler for you. And uh, I think, you know, you got to do your own kind of reading and so forth. Because as, I talk, as I'm going to talk about in that video, I'm very cautious about not inventing the Bruno that I want, which is what Yates did. So keep that in mind. And we have the example of, of what Yeats did to try to avoid that. So sometimes the things that I'm saying, I and myself need to go, well, is that really the case, right? But I think so. I think it is. I think it's just, if you know your philosophy, if you know the basic math, it's not complicated math, uh, then I think it all, it all squares. It all squares what he's saying. So the book... Uh, begins in a very unusual way that is unusual to us now, but wouldn't have been 
unusual to people then. So there's a there's a set of author's introductions, and uh, it's it's addressed uh, from essentially the philosopher uh, or but not really philosopher. It's like God loving um, Giordano Bruno of Nolan, right? The Nolan. So it's kind of like from the God-loving Giordano Bruno, who is the Nolan, that sort of thing. Adolfo is in the house. Good to see you. AG says, I prefer your style of reading rather than speed reading. Oh, that's, thanks for that, uh, AG. I really i am um, not opposed to people learning speed reading and all that sort of stuff, but it's pretty important to, to note that it's not reading, and uh, reading is reading. <laughs> and I prefer depth reading, and there's a reason why I prefer depth reading, there's a reason why I've read Art of Memory three times, right? And there's a reason why I've read this about 10 times, because that's called depth reading. Anyway, Adolfo, good to see you. Thank you for being here. So from the um, the philosopher, uh, the lover of God, the, look, and this is important to understand. Bruno was a pantheist, right? So when he says he's a lover of God, it means he's a lover of you, because he believed that God was everything. Everything was God. The, the trees are God. This shirt is God. You know, and that could get you in hot water during the Inquisition, and it did, <laughs> obviously, because uh, of how he ended. But he says, and he addresses it to the friendly and studious reader. And why is that important? It's very, very important because, first of all, in rhetoric, we want to set the stage for you to have goodwill for us, right? In the victorious mind, I do the same. I do it in just about everything I do as much as to the best of my ability. It's something you've got to practice. You've got to get better at. And, uh, but notice this. He, he wants to get goodwill from the beginning. And he also wants you to be a kind of reader, studious reader. It's very, very important. So this is called repulsion and attraction at the same time in our modern language. Because some people will be like, well, I'm not, I'm not studious, so whatever. Uh, so that's important. Anyway, it starts with the poem. It is set up high, the face of Diana in Chios that seems sorrowful to those who enter her temple, but looks joyful to those who leave it. And the letter of Pythagoras dividing action into two paths while it shows a forbidding face to those who choose the right bestows on them the highest good. That which rises from the profound darkness of the shadows will be welcome in the end though more bitter now than the face or the letter. So, you know, we could we could go into a lot of this. I mean, some of, as I understand it, some of what Bruno's trying to do is replace Aristotelian thinking and restore some of the Pythagorean principles. So this is why he's saying the letter of Pythagoras, right? And, you know, you might want to consult a classicist that could speak a little bit more about that. Um Oh, and when you get this, this introduction uh, help, helps in that regard as well. Now, there's an introduction here to Henry III, and we'll save it for video two of The Art of Memory, but I explain what he's doing here and why he's doing it. Uh, at least I think I do. I, I better make a note to make sure that I did in the script. Um, but there's an address here, and it's a very, very important rhetorical tool. Uh, so... There's a reason we talked about Merlin today, by the way, as well. And there's a reason that it's very important because you can adopt so many tools from this. So Merlin is a magnetic image that I use, and I think Bruno probably used him as well because it's also it has an address here, Merlin to the artist. Now, what is he doing here? Merlin to the artist. At some level, he's wanting us to think of him, I think, as a Merlin-type figure. And, you know... Uh, I don't know to the extent that that's true, but then to the artist, he's the teacher to the artist. So this is really important, and it's a point that isn't really picked up, which, again, I will draw out of Rhetorica ad Herenium for you in video two of Art of Memory. It's super important. It's so clear in Rhetorica ad Herenium if you read the whole thing, not cherry-pick it. People cherry-pick that book. It is deadly to do so if you really want to understand this tradition. 
So one who depicted the Gauls as cockerels, since he is not wholly imprudent and hopes that his depiction is not found as the inept work of an inept artist, has appointed trusted servants and good friends by whom he wishes more natural images to be driven far away. Since you are not ignorance of, ignorant of this, you should worry when you present a true Gaul in more proper images, which cause all who have ears to marvel, not being turned back to by an importuning servant, you will repent. So, it's kind of hard to figure out what's, what's being said here. But at the end of the day, a lot of there's a lot of double speak. There's a lot of backhanded insults that sound like compliments. You know, and it's really it's really funny how that he does this. Um, and to that end, we might just skip ahead to some of the through some of these. Uh, these things and talk about the dialogue. So it starts after these uh, introductions to a dialogue. And you might be thinking, well, what is all this dialogue all about? What the heck? And it's a way of Bruno setting the stage, setting the rules of the game. And dialogues in philosophy often allowed people at that time to say what they thought without getting their heads chopped off because you weren't allowed to say what you thought then. And it is brutal, but so many of the philosophers that we have wrote as religious people, even though they were atheists, and they had to, or they would have been killed. It happened again and again and again. And this has had very deep and sad implications because all kinds of yahoos don't know that. And they go reading Kant and they go reading Hegel and they see that as license to conclude things about religions. But no, those people didn't want to die. That's why they wrote in the ways that they did. Or they didn't want to be excommunicated, or they didn't want to be hassled, or whatever. Understand that. It's very, very important. So no, you can't just say, well, Kant, no, 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 and a thousand times no. Not even Thomas Aquinas. You can't say that. If you, if you look at video one that I'm trying to encourage as many people to watch as possible from the Art of Memory series. There's a comment there from someone who is very angry about how that I portrayed the church there. And the reality is, is that I'm happy to engage in that conversation, but you better bring some big evidence to, to show me where that I've uh, made the mistake and somehow owe an edit to that video because that person has none and there can be none. And the reasons are uh, quite clear, but I'm open to any evidence that people want to uh, show. Anyway, um, the, the characters here are Hermes, Philothemis, and Logopher. And the reason why that a lot of this is happening, this dialogue, this strange little play at the beginning of the book, is it allows the author to, to, because we can't speak directly at this time. We've got to sort of like bury things. Later, when Bruno is before the Inquisition, he messes up. He contradicts himself. He says this, he says that. And, um, he basically gives them all the evidence they need, and, and he he doesn't bury it the way that that it's 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 attempted to be buried somehow here. Anyway, it's it, it's kind of hard to read the whole play here because we don't have uh, people, but the uh, to to play the different parts. But I'll I'll give you a sense of of what the most important parts here are for our memory practice. Um, one of the most important parts really is that. It talks about practice and it talks about the need for training with these skills and how so many people, uh, they have they have light minds and they find practice vulgar. They don't want to put in the effort. They don't want to do the work. So these people are um, put in their place as, you know, uh, you know, you come back when you're ready. Come back when you're ready to train little person <laughs> we're here for the big people right and it's funny how it's done uh, <laughs> now <clears throat> this is very very important to understand this line this art does not merely apply art to memory but opens and introduces a way to the discovery of many different faculties therefore those who receive it should remember to hide it within themselves since because of its dignity they should not casually spread it around. Now, is he really saying hide this from others? Or is he trying to do something like a scarcity tactic in rhetoric that says, oh, well, if this has to be hidden, 
then I'm really, really attracted to it and I really want to pay attention. I don't know. But uh, you can think of that for yourself and let me know what you think. But also there's something else. Remember to hide it within yourself is also a thing of treasure it. Put it deep inside yourself, right? And um, then it says later, we say this, and it says some other things here, but we say this because we wish to lighten the troubles of those people who wish to use their own intellect to measure that of others who are of that unfortunate kind who have long exercised themselves in the best philosophy, but not so far as to come up with their own opinions and who in the final analysis lack any genius of their own and always rely on another's. This is where Bruno is saying to all the people who are like, give us the mnemonic examples. Just give us examples, examples, examples. Then he, he says then, as is said in the Rhetorica Ad Herenium many, many years prior to him, examples are not the key. Limit the examples you give and watch out for these people who think that they're going to come up with something, you know, that's going to convince the world that, oh, I've got the perfect book of examples. Now you can just use these techniques without doing any of the, of the training yourself. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Um, and so he gives this big warning about it. And it's quite funny uh, if you read it carefully. And uh, then it basically goes about how that he's going to, um, he's going to, he's going to proceed. And he says, there's nothing here or in any of our other arts that should give people who are skilled in this kind of philosophizing any difficulty in understanding, provided that they pay attention. Now, this is important that he says this kind of philosophizing, because this is philosophizing in its true meaning, love of knowledge. How do you love knowledge? You pay attention to it. And so there's a little bit of a backhanded compliment as he's doing. Um, so... Part of the key is to pay attention to the information, to love it, to internalize it, to memorize it. So we treat this, we treat of this art under a twofold form and procedure. One is higher and applies more generally to all operations of the mind and is the font of many methods out of which artificial memory may be grasped and discovered among many diverse instruments. It consists of 30 intentions of the shadows, second of 30 conceptions of ideas, and thirdly of many combinations that can be made out of the intentions and concepts by industrially industriously adapting the elements of the first wheel to the elements of those that follow. The other, which follows, focuses on a certain kind of comparative artificial memory. So what is meant there by artificial memory is quite contentious. I have some ideas about it. But when I, uh, what I want to make clear, though, is that he's not saying to use the wheels. And later on, well, it, it's in part two of the, uh, the Art of Memory video. He's, he's actually suggesting that you not use the wheels um but it's it's kind of hard to like sort of see that because of the the the, the way that he double he has all sorts of double speak and so forth anyway uh that's at least my finding of it and i could be totally wrong and and hopefully people who have other ideas will will speak up and say so and find it in the first place so that's a reading from on the shadows of the ideas uh, by giordano bruno all right everybody so if um Anybody has anything they, they want to say or ask about these matters? Now is the time. Let me know. I am uh, going to go into... Let me see. Do I have any other things to announce while we... Oh, yes. We do, we do, we do. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. So for those of you who want to read ahead, Robert Flood, very interesting character. You'll want to uh, get some of his writings. He did some interesting and strange things with memory palaces. And there's some very beautiful diagrams to help figure out what he's talking about, ways of doing it. And uh, I want to dive deep into describing and discussing some of these things, some of these matters. Uh, and, and one is never certain that we could fully understand it because we can't speak with them. But... He has, a, he, has, he has a very beautiful sort of understanding of the same conclusion that I think that, uh, that Bruno came to. And so while we wait and see if there's anything anybody wants to say, I just hope read this opening of, the, uh, of a defense that he has here. He says, When I had carefully considered that the misery of this life would only be ended by blissful death, I observed that human wandering on earth should be compared to the restless sea which when churned up with agitated waves 
causes incessant danger to the corporeal ship propelled here and there on an uncertain course and causes the sailor to be utterly ignorant of how he might by chance bring his ship to an unknown port of good fortune. Thus it happens that hardly one out of a thousand directs his life to that that longed-for goal of happiness. Yet the the wisdom of the ancients bears witness to the fact that there is a certain sure and undoubted seat of human happiness in this world, which some auspiciously investigate with long wandering and due inquiry. And by this wisdom we are taught that Moses, the master of divine philosophy who certainly conversed with God and obtained the key to both types of understanding, both supernatural and natural, and by divine assistance and illumination of the most Holy Spirit, reached the shores of happiness. Moses' virtue was attained by Bezalel, Joshua, David, Solomon, and all the prophets whose wisdom, in fact, some of the ancient philosophers imitated. Among these, Mercurius Trismegistus especially assumed and laid claim to a place for himself. His admirable understanding of things above and below has been depicted vividly for us by his sacred sermons and his knowledge in the Smargadine table. Now, this above and below stuff, in Bruno, when he was at the Inquisition, he said loud and clear, and he says it in here, the above and the below are nowhere except for within. They are one, right? And this is very, very important. It's very important to understand. Anyway, I found this in Melbourne when I was there. After I gave the TED Talk, I went to the uh, the bookstore and I was like, I can't believe this. I need this. And it was so amazing. And then I started to read it and he has this ship metaphor. And I thought, wow, that's what a weird synchronicity, a weird coincidence. Because you'll notice that the cover of The Victorious Mind has an ocean metaphor, right? And we talk about the ocean quite a bit in that book as a as an ongoing metaphor and how to navigate calm seas, navigate ourselves to calm seas, how to create the ocean we want, how to be the ocean, better said, how to fuse with it. So if you um, haven't got the, if you're a Kindle person and you haven't got the Kindle pre-order, please, please check it out. And uh, there's uh, the linky link for you to uh, get the pre-order. If you get the pre-order, send me the receipt. I will send you how to stop thinking, a free mini course for people who are uh, supporting during the launch. And, um, in that mini course, there's an opportunity to get the audiobook in advance, uh, like within minutes of when you start how to stop thinking. All right. So AG says, I wished you were my teacher from kindergarten to high school. My life would have been so different. Anyways, I'm focused on the now and have memorized so much using lessons of the master class. Love you, man. Well, I love you too. Thank you so much for your kind words. And, you know, people ask me to, um, to go and teach young children. And I always say no, because I don't know anything about them. And the youngest I've taught is high school. That's how I started all of this. I was using memory techniques like crazy. And one day I, when I was writing curriculum for a school, it was not, it was like a a school that is an after school school. That's the way I always thought of it. So, you know, parents unhappy with how the public education system was helping their kids, sent uh, their kids to this additional school for a couple hours to get some training. And I did more university level curriculum writing. One day a teacher didn't show up. And so Haiti ran the school. She said, hey, get in there, teach them. And I got through their stuff in a couple of minutes. And I said, hey, what do you want to do next? And they said, we don't know, you're the teacher. I I was thinking, I don't know what to do with high school students. So I said, hey, you want to learn how to memorize the the alphabet backwards? Bam, they had it, they did it. Like 98% of them had it all within a couple of minutes. They could do the alphabet backwards which is to be expected. And uh, it was beautiful. And then they said, well, what else can we learn? And so forth. So we were, I, I had them memorizing cards and stuff. It was hilarious how quickly they picked it up. And then they said, well, could you write all this down? And I did. And uh, that wound up, that document wound up becoming my first book, which just was a hit. And the rest has been history. So I'm really grateful to, you know, that happening. And I've learned so much. I used all my university level research skills to figure out how to do all this stuff that is appearing now and if you want to join Jonathan Levy and I you know if you if you um where where is it if you haven't read Jonathan's um the only skill that matters I know it's around here somewhere (laughs) I have to have a a look at my bookshelf I keep changing it around and then I don't re-alphabetize it but um if you've read the back there, he says something very kind, which I've never forgotten. 
and uh, basically how that I helped with Super Learner. And, you know, I still do um, often. And so he and I are getting together to help people who want to start online businesses. The link is here in, in the chat. You can find there and join us for a live stream that we're doing to help you all. And we just want to really just give people some knowledge and insights about how all this stuff works, how to do it in a way that Google picks up on, etc. to the best of our knowledge. I mean, there's a lot of mysteries and uh, we want to help you all. And uh, I think I know some people here who already have some internet training and so forth. In any case, AG, I really appreciate your kind words. And, you know, this is happening because of people wanting this tradition, wanting this training. And we're so fortunate that the world is still interested in the age of computers. And I think it is the age of computers that has made more interest in memory because memory is not landing in computers well. It's increasing our cognitive demands and we need to have the mental faculties to uh, perform. Sorry about that noise there. I have to use a straw because I have medicine on my lips at the moment. All right, Kenji B says, what do you think the additional facilities were faculties? Oh, oh, the additional faculties. Well, there's a lot of them, and I have them fresh to my mind, at least six of them. That's uh, part two of the Art of Memory video. So please um, check that out. Have you seen Kenji B part one of the Art of Memory that's currently on YouTube now? The link is here many times. I, I don't want to um, keep doing the linky links, but um, watch that, and then in part two, I'm going to show you very distinctly and dig out of the Rhetorica ad Terenium what many of those faculties were. They're very, very important, and I think you'll find them very, very useful. So let's save that for that, but thank you for asking. Uh, Christian says, uh, Clink to Flood and Bruno. Oh, yeah, everybody, you know, we, we've got to play brain games, uh, especially since Christian's here. We play it often when you're not here, but check out Christian's channel, and uh, he's got some good clink stuff over there that I think is very uh, clinkalicious. <laughs> and he's got his pie uh, thing that he recited pie, beautiful, beautiful. And he discusses it, teaches you what to do, how to do it, beautiful. And you say you've read some of his Kabbalistic writings? Yeah, um, some of them are certainly in here. I'm obviously reading it all in context, but um, this uh, uh, interests me because of the memory palace stuff. But like I say, I was so intrigued to see the ocean metaphor there. And, you know, what he's saying is so important is to understand that the world is in you. You are the ocean. This is a, a traditional wisdom that comes up again and again and again and again and again. Nietzsche said, become the ocean. Very important. All right. So Christian says, a wonderful tradition brought to 21st century accessibility. Yeah. It's interesting. I, I, I'm so surprised to see just how integral it is so deep into history and that we still can see that people are thinking of it and using it this way. Uh, and, you know, in the Bhagavad Gita, it says, Idam shariram kaunteya kushetram idi iti apidyate etha yo veditam prahukshet rajna iti tad vidaha shetrajnam chapimam vedi sarva shetrashu and that means, it basically means be the ocean, but it means that the field and the person who perceives the field and all that are in it, when they are one, when you realize that you are one with the field that you see in front of your eyes, you are it, you are that. It's a beautiful Sanskrit. It's... um. I guess it's book 8 or chapter 8, however it is there, verse 1 and 2 in the Bhagavad Gita. Did I call it something else earlier? I think maybe I said something else, but it's Bhagavad Gita 8. And uh, it was very important today because I uh, was thinking about it a lot. The number 8 came up in one of um, these exercises from Yannick Silver's Cosmic Journal. So, and, you know, he's doing a lot of work to revive this oneness, non-duality thinking that is so important to human survival and you know, it's never faded, but we need to revive it. We keep needing to revive it day in and day out for so many people. And you can do it in a secular way. It, it's, it's so important. It doesn't have to have belief. Belief is not required. Because if it's true, why would you need to believe in it? What is so lost is the understanding that this is a science. Consciousness is a science. And it needs you to be scientific about it. 
And that's what we talk about in The Victorious Mind, training you to tune your memory to be a scientist of your memory and of your consciousness at the same time, to meditate scientifically so that you arrive at the correct conclusions about what is really going on here. And then understand that correct is just a word that appears in the screen. And you don't have to have opinions about it. The screen doesn't care about your opinions, actually. <laughs> Things are just going on and free will and all that sort of stuff. Anyways, if it's interesting to you, check it out. I try to make it as clear as possible. It's just a mathematical thing. And then when you see it, you can't unsee it. It's just amazing. And then you wonder, why didn't I see this all along? And then you might realize, oh, well, I hadn't trained my brain to see it. And I hadn't made the shift. And cognitive shifting is a real skill. So a lot of people, you know, they don't, they don't train to, sh to have cognitive shifting. But you can. You can train. All right. Logan's Music asks, how do you self-motivate yourself to keep going with recall in the memory palace? Please help because it feels like I always lack motivation at the end of the day. Great, Logan. So Logan's Music. That's a great question. It's the perfect question. And it's the, the answer is, the answer is um, always be yourself unless you can be Batman. Then always be Batman. Whatever happened to Julie? We haven't seen her for so long. Maybe it's because I don't drink from this cup anymore. If I start drinking to this cup, will she reappear? I hope so. Um, oh, somehow our chats are not appearing on the screen all of a sudden anymore. Sorry about that. So we've got a lot from Christian and... Uh, I wonder if I have to refresh something. Are we even still live? I don't know. Let me know in the chat if we're still live. Because uh, somehow our uh, our little wheel here, a wheel of chats on the screen has paused. I'm not sure if I need to uh, update it somehow. We may have lost our, our Facebook people. Sorry if that's the case. I'm not sure if I have to redo something. I don't know if I will undo the nature of reality if I shut something off. Uh, maybe I just try and press that button, see what happens. <laughs> um, now we press this button. Does it come back? I hope so. All right. Well, sorry if we lost our Facebook people. Anyway, um, we're still live on YouTube. Great, great. Thanks for confirming. Hopefully that'll start showing back up again. Technology, technology. Whoa, there it is. There it is. So the refresh helped. It helped. Uh, great. Wonderful. All right. So back to Logan's music. So Logan or Logan's music. The answer really is be yourself unless you can be Batman. And a lot of people are not being themselves. So this might not be the answer anybody wants or likes. But in order to, you know, dial down to what motivates me, to keep going with recall rehearsal in order to memorize long-term information is that I only memorize information that improves my life. It's that simple, right? So what improves my life? Well, I just gave some Sanskrit there, right? That improves my life big time, right? Now, why we can go into, that's what I talk about in The Victorious Mind uh, in detail. But you need to be certain that what you're memorizing is actually improving your life. Now, that doesn't mean that you want it or you need it. I mean, believe me, look, when I did my PhD, I had to deal with biblical Hebrew and I was just like, what the heck am I doing? What am I doing? Why? Why is something so difficult, etc. But, you know, better she all that stuff, right? You, you get it done. You get it done. And you get it done because the PhD, getting that done, was higher. Higher than the, the smaller thing, right? So make a mission. We have uh, still free on the YouTube live stream there how to make a vision statement for your memory. So make sure your vision statement is, uh, is in order. Now, why is all this important? It's because willpower, as ben Benjamin Hardy, is that his name? Willpower doesn't work. And uh, willpower doesn't work. It's true because we need to rig the brain in order to work for us to make it happen automatically. And so I often talk about how that neurochemically you need dopamine and myelin and all this stuff going because they're the chemicals involved in habit formation. And so if you want to be able to memorize stuff that you're not interested in and that is hard work to you and you want to be able to do it well, you have to memorize stuff that is interesting to you. So you develop the habit of just being able to do it whether you like it or not. 
and that you can do it in a way that's pretty much autopilot. Oh, got to make a memory palace. Oh, got to have some magnetic imagery. Oh, I got to organize it in a particular way so that it makes sense for the memory palace. Oh, I got to do recall rehearsal. You just get it done because you're so used to doing it for something that makes you feel good, that's blissful. You've done it for at least 90 days, ideally every day, but minimum four times a week. This is what we see in the neuroscience of habit formation. And then away you go. So that's how you do it. Pick something you want to memorize, memorize it for a minimum of 90 days, whatever that is. I've done it with biblical Hebrew. I've done it with German. I've done it with a little bit of, uh, to the, the extent of other little languages, Chinese, Sanskrit, done it with poetry. I did it with my TED talk, but not for 90 days because <laughs> a little bit of a story, but I had to, um, I better say TEDx talk, sorry, but um, uh, I had changed it. <laughs> Not exactly at the last minute, but I was just like, no, this isn't right. So I wrote another one and then I had to remember another one. But anyway, no problem, right? Because preparation. And I didn't feel like memorizing another one. I just had this moment where I was like, oh, but this one, but it's not right. So do another one and then and do it. And, and I, I think it, um, it, uh, it is very, very important to understand this, that uh, you can't allow your life to be ruled by your likes. Uh, Adi Shankaracharya calls it the like-dislike monster. And how you do that is you just get really good at memorizing stuff that you do like so that when the time comes, you can remember what you don't like regardless and not have opinions about it. Just just don't be a person that, that is, is prisoner to your likes and dislikes. So I hope that helps you out. Um, uh, Logan's Music, that's a great name. Is that an actual store? Uh, there's your name. Yeah, that's what it was. Great. Uh, let's see. Chroma walking. Oh, you're great. You're here. Good, good. Uh, oh, you're so, so I don't even know if you're still here, but you'll listen to the replay. Good to see you. Wonderful, wonderful. Always good. Thanks for being a channel supporter, channel member. Appreciate that. And all, all that you do to support this. Wonderful. And uh, yeah, look forward to your thoughts on the replay. Hope this uh, gives you some things to do. And I know you're reading Art of Memory, so this is going to map on very nicely for you as part of our sort of asynchronous a uh, course on the art of memory that we're building together. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. Bleak Sand says, I'm one of those people who can't recall the details of a previous conversation during the heat of discourse when it really matters. I often have to concede, but I can feel my retort somewhere in my mind. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, so, you know, a lot of people have this. Let's, let's talk about this a bit. This is interesting. Hold on a second. Let's make some bubbles. I'm not doing that just to be funny. It actually helps your voice. <clears throat> helps your throat. All right. Now, it's very, very important when you want to work on having what you want to say in a conversation that you do exactly what I'm going to tell you right now, Bleak Sen. Please do this, right? You say, hopefully after some time with the course, my everyday life recall will improve. Here's the thing. You don't need hope. You just need to show up consistently. Earlier today, we talked about how to set yourself free. F-R-E-E. -E, frequent practice in a state of relaxation, a spirit of experimentation, and entertainment. That's what memory training does for you. <laughs> endlessly entertained so here's what I want you to do I want you to start writing out what it is that you wanted to say in the past a little memory exercise what was the last two to three times that this happened what was it you wanted to say if you can't remember just start to play around with it name your friends describe the situation or just think of a hypothetical of what you wanted to say there's a video called The Fist on this channel where William Gordon and I, who did the photographs and the, my, the map in the memory palace in Victoria's mind, which you can access immediately when you, well, almost immediately when you get the uh, pre-order and send me your receipt and then you can, uh, you know, start to, to see all this stuff uh, in advance. But there's a walkthrough of, of, uh, of everything so that you can uh, follow the full memory palace. But William Gordon and I, we made a YouTube video. You can look it up, my name or Magnetic Mary Method and the fist. And we talk about how when you're in conversations, when you want to say something and you, you, know, you can't find it in your mind, 
you can make a little bit of a fist and relax yourself. Just relax. And when you practice your memory and relaxation, relaxation will help you. And then you can let the person finish and uh, hold the memory in your hand because you've, you've made your hand like a little impromptu temporary mini memory palace. And uh, that can be very, very wonderful to do. Now, the exercise, once you've written out some descriptions of these situations that you've had in the past, is to write down what it is you wanted to say and then memorize it and then recite it and start to practice speaking fluently what it is you want to say and you'll be a better interlocutor you'll be able to perform better your retorts and that's uh, something i think that you'll find very very useful and i hope that it uh, helps you out all right now let's see here Oh, and by the way, the Bleakson, the poetry course is a good one to help make sure that you're starting to be able to memorize things word for word, verbatim, and really do it. But get yourself relaxed. Train your memory when you're relaxed so that when you're using it, you're also relaxed. This is why when I was giving my TEDx, all these people are like, aren't you nervous? Because I just, apparently, I looked very calm and cool and collected. I was doing my thing, memorizing the names of all the people I met. People are saying, aren't you nervous? About what? <laughs> just be relaxed relax we relax in order to be relaxed later right it's very important all right so i hope that helps you out please sam now christian says hello to the magnetic Mary method family he says i love when anthony catches the spirit and chants sanskrit yeah i love it too it's fun christian says refreshing high-mindedness against the doldrums yes we need it we need it we need high-mindedness indeed and we need the minded that we need the mind to realize that it is somehow together, right? We are teamed together right now, and we can be exponential. Which reminds me, I should be saying, "Hey, share this around," so that we can be exponential about the memory tradition as it's taught here and other places. And uh, let's have a grand council of all the nemesis getting together. <laughs> so. That's beautiful. Refreshing high-mindedness against the doldrums. Kenji says, what about when a belief seems persistent, like a roller coaster causing fear? Great. So in the victorious mind, what I talk about, there's a number of things you can do, but two of them are very, very simple. So are my thoughts useful? How do they behave? Just like that. And then you go, oh, well, my thought is here again. Is it useful? No. How does it behave? Like a roller coaster. That can help. And you train yourself. When thoughts come up, are my thoughts useful? How do they behave? Now, there's a number of other things that we get into. And I memorize them in Sanskrit, right? So it's very long. Chitameva Mahadosham, Chitameva Hi Balakaha, Chitameva Mahatmayam, Chitameva Mahanasa, Chitameva Hi Mithya Atma, Chitam Shashavi Shanava, Chitam Nasti Sada Satyam, Chitam Vanja Ku Meravat, Chitam Shunyam Nasandeha, Brahmaeva Sakalam Jagat, Ameva Hi Chai Tanyam, Ameva Hi Nir Gunam, Maneva Hi Samsaram, Maneva Hi Mandalam, Maneva Hi Bantatvam, Maneva Hi Patakam, Maneva Mahadukam, Maneva Sharirakam, Maneva Parpanchak. Yam maneva kalebaram dea mitis and kalpaha herda diagrantiri reta kala triapi tanis dis arm ramati kevalam dea mit no de triapi bavam yata dea janam uchayate kala triapi tanis dis arm ramati kevalam dea miti ad bavam sada sad bavam eva cha kala triapi tanis dis arm ramati kevalam dea mitis and kalpaha tat perpanchami ochayate Kala triapi tanis di sarm brahmati kevalam de ahimiti sankalpaha tade vaginam uchayate kala triapi tanis di sarm brahmati kevalam de ahimiti abudhi malina vasan uchayate kala triapi tanis di sarm brahmati kevalam de ahimiti abudhi satyam jivasa evasaha kala triapi tanis di sarm brahmati kevalam Dea himiti sankalpaha mahanarakam iratam 
Kala Triya Pitanis di Savam Brahmati Kevalam Dea Hamiti Abuti Mana Viti Nishitam Kala Triya Pitanis di Savam Brahmati Kevalam Dea Hamiti Abuti Perachina Mitiriate Kala Triya Pitanis di Savam Brahmati Kevalam Dea Hamiti Adyanam Savam Shokam Mitiratam Kala Triya Pitanis di Savam Brahmati Kevalam Dea Hamiti Adyanam Samuel Sparshamiti Kat te kala triya pitanis di sabam brahmati kevalam dea hamiti abudhi tadeva marinam shmuratam kala triya pitanis di sabam brahmati kevalam dea hamiti abudhi tadeva shobhanam shmuratam kala triya pitanis di sabam brahmati kevalam dea hamiti abudhi mahapamiti shmuratam Kala Triya Pitanis di Savam Brahmati Kevalam Dea Hamiti Abudhi Tush de Sivahi Chashayate Kala Triya Pitanis di Savam Brahmati Kevalam Dea Hamiti Sankalpaha Sarva Dosha Miti Shmuratam Kala Triya Pitanis di Savam Brahmati Kevalam Amevahi Guptatma Ameva Narantaram Anandam Paramam Manamidam Drasham Nakinchena Ameva Param Brahma Ameva Gurur Guru Anandam Paramam Manamidam Drasham Nakinchena Ameva Akiladhara Ameva Sukatsukam Anandam Paramam Manamidam Drasham Nakinchena Ameva Param Jyoti Ameva Akiladmaka Anandam Paramam Manamidam Drasham Nakinchena Ameva He Tripped at Ma Ameva He Near Guna Anandam Paramam Manamidam Drasham Nakinchena Ameva He Purn at Ma Ameva Paratana Anandam Paramam Manamidam Drasham Nakinchena Ameva He Shant at Ma Ameva He Shashvata Anandam Paramam Manamidam Drasham Nakinchena Ameva he sarvatra, ameva he sustira, anandam paramam manam midam drasham na kinchena, atma janam param shastram, atma janam manupamam, atma janam paro yoga, atma janam paragati, atma janam chatanasha, atma janam vimuktidam, atma janam bayanasham, atma janam sukhava. Hum. So just do that. Your thoughts will disappear. It's easy. I talk about it in the victorious mind. So, <laughs> uh, you know, give that give that a chance. All those roller coaster thoughts will just disappear every time you do that. Because it's a series of questions, really. It's like, well, are my thoughts useful? How do they behave? Do my thoughts have value? What, what, how, how real are my thoughts? Uh, where does this idea that the world even exists come from? To whom is the world even appearing? And when you train yourself to ask these thoughts, man, you just feel so good because your mind is just like blah, blah, blah. And you're just like, boom, you've got something. You have a victorious mind. Literally, I chose that word for a reason because I have a mind still to this day that sometimes, not always, it's much, much less. I've even learned how to shut it off. It's unbelievable. I never thought that you could actually experience no thoughts, but I did. And it's amazing. It's so beautiful. And so this is this seems essential to me. And the, the reason why I think that it works and, and Gary Weber talks about it in uh, Evolving Beyond Thought, which is very beautiful, uh, this book here, uh, which is where that text is, where I learned it and I memorized it from that text. It, it, it basically, the reason why we have I, I, me, me, oh, I'm so worried about tomorrow. Oh, I'm so worried about what I did yesterday and I'm embarrassed about it. Oh, and I wish I was actually somewhere else right now instead of right here. The reason why we have that is because the default mode network of the brain is just trained in our culture to live here. I, I, me, me. Oh, it's so tedious. It's so boring. And there's really no evidence that there is you, right? How do we know this? Well, because... One day your parents gave birth and this little person named you showed up and then they said, well, we're going to call you Bill and uh, you're going to have a middle name and then we're going to put this on this piece of paper 
and then we're going to force that piece of paper on you for the rest of your life so that when you go to school, they're going to use that piece of paper. And then later, they're going to give you a number. And that number is going to be linked to your name. And you're going to be trained to always respond to that name. And then they're going to come and they're going to say, all right, so here's your paycheck and here's your bank account. And here's this, here's that. And then here's your bills. And here's your responsibilities. And here's where you plug in, punch in and punch out and blah, 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 blah. And then your mind is just going to be like, blah, blah, blah. Oh, yeah, I got to be at work, 9.15. No, <gasps> the traffic. Oh, and then the radio is going to be on and there's going to be this guy who's like, oh, there's a new war in Iraq and blah, 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 blah. And then you're going to be like, oh, there's a war in Iraq and blah, blah, blah. And then your mind is going to be... It's just like a zombie wasteland in there. Blah, 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 blah. And you have no tools to shut it off. But now you do in the victorious mind over there. Got to remember that. I need a mnemonic for reverse screens. <laughs> but... I meditated for years and years and years and years and years, and I even thought that, that it was impossible to shut off thought. I embraced thought, and I robbed myself of silence, mental silence. And I think that there's probably different ways to get there, and I think it comes from a combination of certain things. But if Kenji B wants to shut off the roller coaster causing fear, the most likely thing is to be trained to when thought arises, shut it off with tools that are deep in your procedural memory. So we've already talked about it today. Man, it's hot in here. Woo. Um, should have turned on the air conditioning. It's Australia after all. David has snow in Chicago, I, I seem to recall. But uh, <laughs> we have summer. Well, it's winter. Apparently, I don't know what, it, what, what uh, winter has no meaning in Australia anymore. But um, for me as a Canadian. But the idea is, is you can shut it off when you're trained and you get it deep into your procedural memory. And so by, you know, I do what I talk about. I sat there and I memorized it and I've been practicing it for years. Not a day has gone past where I have missed this in my awareness. I just do this every day and it feels so good. And then when I'm walking out in the day, yes, thoughts still come. But the quality of those thoughts has completely changed. And then when the odd little nasty tiger or weird little weapon makes its way in, boom, destroyed. It's beautiful, it's beautiful, it's beautiful. All right, so let's see here. Um, Christian says, don't, don't press that button. <laughs> Logan's Music says, be yourself, be like Batman, got it. Yes, and Logan, Logan's Music, the implications of all this and where you get when you go from the default mode network, because what this ultimately does, to finish my thought here, is... Um, you go into what's called the task positive network. This is what Mihai Cheek sent Mihai Yu called the, the 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 flow, the state of flow, the zone. And so you just wind up being in there a lot more. And then you notice when you're kicked up here and you're like, I me, oh poor me, oh no, oh no, worry, worry, worry. Which, you know, sometimes, given the world being what it is, you got to. You gotta show up here, you gotta strategize, right? But you know. Do you have to stay there? No, you can kick yourself back there. And procedural memory, if it's trained, will just automatically give you the tools that remind you, oh, no, no, there we go. Sam Harris talks about this quite a bit, right? About the committee in your mind. And if you would just train, you'll, you'll have this filter, this distance from it, and you'll be able to get back into the moment. And a lot of people, they are really weird in the, in the spiritual traditions where they're like, ah, no practice is needed, nonsense. I don't think this happens if you don't show up and practice. And how do you practice? In a way that sets you free. Frequent practice in a state of relaxation, which is what the memory techniques are so good for, and when you do them the right way, of course. And then um, experimentation. Everything's an experiment. Every memory palace is a laboratory in your mind. And you'd be entertained. So all that stuff, like it's a lot, and that's just a, a quarter of the Sanskrit that I've memorized so far. It's so entertaining to memorize. Why? Art of memory, right? The Ars Combinatoria meets Ars Memorativa, Memory Palaces, plus the Art of Combination. Bam! We just get that stuff memorized. It's so much fun. All right. So where were we in the chat here? Anyway, I hope that helps you out, Kenji. Long, long answer there. Uh, John Eric is in the house. Good to see you, John. Wonderful, wonderful. Thanks for your correspondence recently over the uh, YouTube pages. Regarding your comment about always be yourself, I love the phrase, you cannot fail at being yourself. <laughs> That's right, you cannot. And then when you understand what you really are, which is not the guy with the name on the license plate, 
That's the fictional thing that the world has invented in order to turn its gears to grind out whatever it is that humans think that they're doing with their fantasies of progress and their strange conclusions about the nature of time and their repressive need to hold back out of jealousy and envy the progress of others if in so far that there is such a thing as progress and so on you know they're not allowing us to be ourselves because we're too busy being bill we're too busy being these little fictional characters that run around oh look at this this piece of paper says that my name has to do that and if i don't do it by april 23rd well then <laughs> fomo fear of missing out or fear of you know <laughs> severe repercussions because you know this and that. So I don't have all the answers for this, but one thing that really helps is to stop thinking. <laughs> so if you want to stop thinking and you've sent me a receipt for the Victoria's Mine, please send it to me so I can send you the free additional course to tide you over while we're waiting for Amazon to figure out all its stuff with the Victoria's Mine, and I'll send that to you. And uh, yeah, I don't know how to feel about all the little roller coaster games that I put together there for people, but it's a legit course that'll help you understand this, help you start to practice in a very simple way and uh, get there very, very quickly. All right. So yeah, thank you. Thank you again, John, uh, for being here. Christian says, apparently I can't put the brain games link in the chat. We'll play it. Yeah. I don't know. There's something about, because if, if people put stuff in there, then they'll put in, you know, whatever. And then, yeah. So Incredible developer says, I am Batman. Awesome. Um, Adolfo is driving and listening. Well, I hope that helps. Christian says, always take out for bubbles. Oh, and you just got the pre-order. Well, thank you for that. Clink. Yeah. We're hoping that people um, also, you know, can do that just because it helps tell the robots know that people care about this book. Uh, oh, thank you for sharing on Twitter as well. Watch for the bots. Yeah, you know, bots. Did I ever tell you the story of how I won Breakthrough Advertising? Uh, is it Eugene Schwartz? Yeah, Eugene Schwartz's uh, Breakthrough Advertising. Is that what it's called? I never memorized his name or the title of the book. I, yeah, it is Eugene Schwartz. Um, and it is Breakthrough Advertising, I'm pretty sure. Anyway, Eugene Schwartz wrote a lot of the advertising for Harry Lorraine back in the day. And uh, that's very exciting to study his stuff. And I won a copy of that. I mean, it's a very hard book to get and it's very expensive, but I won one because of bots. And so it was an acronym contest for bots. And I said, boring old technology succeeding <laughs> because that's, you know, my interest in this old technology of the memory palace and just, you know, fundamentals in life. Christian says, Sanskrit sounds awesome over the electro dub mix I have in the background. Oh, wow. Maybe we can collab on something uh, with your skills. How many stations was that, says uh, Christian. So that's a good question. I number it in the book, but it's hard, to, it's hard to say exactly how many stations there is because when you know these techniques, and I'm sure you do, it's not really the case that, that there is a number, but it's 32 verses. And because of how it works, so, you know, for example, Kalatriapi tennis di sarvam brahmati kevalam. That repeats again and again and again. So it's only on one station, right? Same thing with anandam paramam manamidam drasham na kinchena. That's only on one station once. And then I just pick it up again and again and again because I know it's there. So it's kind of like this in the beginning, but then once you have it, you just know that that's what's supposed to be there. And then, of course, you have a lot of things that come up again and again and again, like chatam. Well, you only have to memorize that once. And then you just kind of know there's like a wormhole technology. So I explain it in a way that I hope is very, very useful for people in the book. And I explain that it's not a one-to-one -one correspondence to what happens in the mind. And then that's why the book comes with a video walkthrough to just show the ins and outs. And, you know, a book can only go so far, but if you don't read both, if you don't read the description and you don't watch the video, you still might not quite get it. And understand this, and I'm not alone in this, Bruno just hammers on it. You cannot expect to learn this if you don't do it. If you are sitting there and waiting to read, 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 read another thing, take another course, hoping that one day it's going to click and then you're going to get it and then you can start. Sorry, cowboy, but that lipstick is going to dry up and it's going to crumble and it's going to fall to the ground and you're never going to get, you know, the makeup on. No, 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 no. You've got to jump in. You've got to do. This is learned by doing. 
and then it is done. And as I said in Art of Memory Part 1, you don't even it's not even theory until that you've started practicing. Theory only starts to help you once that you practice, which is the strange work that we do here, where the master class works in conjunction with our live streams and all this stuff, where we need to theorize endlessly to improve our practice, but we can't even theorize until that we're practicing, right? And this is also something of the spiritual tradition. And it says this in the Atma Bodha by Adi Shankaracharya, the one who came up with that beautiful thing, the like-dislike monster, or at least James Schwartz gives that as the translation from the Sanskrit. Uh, and it says, you know, constant practice of the self neutralizes ignorance, uh, which is a beautiful thing, right? Uh, just, just understand that, that constant practice is, is what we need to neutralize ignorance, right? So, and he says, constant practice neutralizes, constant practice of the self neutralizes ignorance as a base, neutralizes an acid, purifying the individual self. I think that's the actual, the, the full line, correct, in the James Schwartz translation. I think that's what, how exactly how it goes. Um, constant practice of the self neutralizes ignorance at, like a base or as a base neutralizes an acid, purifying the individual self. I don't have the book here, but uh, it's in another room and I'm pretty sure it's, it's like that. Now I would go back and I'd be like, oh, was it like an acid or as an acid? And I could fix that. Um, one of the things that I think of, I don't know what you guys think, let me know, I'd love to know your opinion. But when you're memorizing a translation of a text, is it really worth getting hung up on like as or as? If you don't know the original language and you're not memorizing the original language, like for the, with the Bible, for example, right? You can get all of these little, you can get hung up on all these little things, but does it really matter when you don't even know the original language? So you think of that. And then when you know the Sanskrit, right? Uh, for example, in the stuff that I'm studying, well, I want to know it head on, but the actual English iteration, I don't know. I don't actually have the answer for myself, but it is kind of cool to know the exact translation as it's given by the different translators. But I'm a little bit flexible and relaxed with it because I'd rather just know the Sanskrit and then know the gist of what the, what the English should be. And then you can actually speak about it a little bit more relaxed and so forth and just throw down on the Sanskrit because you, you've got it, right? And I would recommend, and it's what I do recommend, people who, who spend time with me to help with memorizing scripture in original languages, do it that way so that you can put the focus on the original language. I think you'll get more out of it. You'll feel more connected to the sounds and the meanings and all that sort of stuff. Uh, but certainly, if it's your if it's your wish, then you know get it all word perfect in the English too. But understand that there's so many variations of the translations in English that it's always going to be incorrect somehow. It's always going to be different than some other translation, and you just you know you get it. You play the wrong game, I think. All right. Um... Christian says, awesome, I'm writing an extension of my book, a section on survival drinking during the apocalypse. Oh, I hope, you, yeah, yeah, your book. Um, I hope you can join Jonathan and I. And if you have any questions about like books and marketing books, we're going to be doing that live stream over on the Facebook. So hope you can join us there. Uh, you say, regarding translations, intentions are king in my practice. Pronounce as best you can, but dot, dot, dot. Yeah, I, I think that that's, um, that's a good way to think of it. You know, Jonathan and I recently we were talking. Jonathan Levy from Superlearner, on our uh, other our, our YouTube. We have a shared YouTube channel, and we were chatting over there. And basically, the idea came up. You know, content is king, but context is God. And I really like that for what we we're talking about here, which is you know, very important to keep in mind. The content is the king for sure, but context is God. So figure out your context, and that will really help guide your memory practice how you're doing, what you're doing, and so forth. So, I don't know. I think uh, somehow our on-screen thing is is a little bit mutilated. I don't know what's going on with it. Maybe that needs a, <clears throat> a refresh or whatever. But if there's nothing further, I hope you guys all enjoyed today. Really appreciate the back and forth. Love hanging out with you. If you want, get the Victorious Mind. I've got uh, some, some goodies to share over there with you. Just send the receipt and... Uh, I'll hook you up ASAP for the free course for early supporters to get um, How to Stop Thinking, which is a little mini course to tide you over. 
as you um, wait for Amazon to get you that stuff. And we're, we're the print book versions are coming, and the audio book will be set up on Audible. It's in review, but for people who have um, the pre uh, order a copy and the free course, How to Stop Thinking, you will have an opportunity to also get the audiobook in advance with a little bit of uh, roller coasters that hopefully don't, as uh, Kenji was saying, uh, seem too much like a roller coaster. And I talk about that in How to Stop Thinking as, you know, a, a way of thinking through the gravity of the current situation and the, the worldhood of the world as such. And hopefully it is... Uh, it is understood and appreciated for what it is, but um, the worldhood of the world is as such. And I hope that you all um, are doing well and that you're, you're um, focusing on the things that, that really matter, that make you blissful, that make you peaceful, that enable you to be more blissful and peaceful regardless of what's going on. And that you can, rather than curse the darkness, light a candle and be the candle and then allow that candle that you are to light other lights. And I think if you focus on that, you will find that memory is not something that you need to achieve or anything. It's something that you are. And so long as you're focused on that, it'll always be improving because you'll have better things to remember about your life. And as Christian says, the mind creates bliss, and it's open now. It is indeed. It is indeed. And so, on the note of bliss and memory being opened, thank you, Christian, as always, for your wonderful being and for brain games. We'll play brain games. Thank you, Kenji. I, I, I'm glad that metaphor works for you. If any of this is a gift, then as Lewis Hyde says, Lewis Hyde, better pronounced, says, the gift is only a gift if it's kept in circulation. So if you're new here, get subscribed, share this around, keep it in circulation. That's what I'm doing. Memory training was a gift. I don't know why it appeared in my life when it did, but it was a gift and it was given because it's so powerful. And humanity needs to keep giving it. Keep it in circulation. It is a gift. And I do what I do as best as I can to my abilities because we must give the gift in order for it to be a gift. The gift, Lewis Hyde tells us, is a gift only when it's kept in circulation. And when the day that Tony Bizan gave me the Warrior of the Mind emblem for outstanding contributions to global mental literacy, I started to plan that one day I will give this to because this gift, which has meant so much to me, fortified so much of what I'm doing and created a closeness to the tradition that I couldn't have even imagined I would have felt when I already felt so close to it in the first place. That is something I can't wait for the moment when I give it potentially to you. So thanks to all who helped me keep the gift in circulation. I really appreciate it. And never forget that that candle that you light can be passed on to others. So light that candle and light it large and then pass it on in a special acknowledgement to Christian. Go over to Christian's channel, get subscribed there. He does cool things with memory techniques. He does cool things with lots of things, but with memory techniques, he's got a book coming out that uh, has to do some things with memory and uh, you're going to love it. And he's also created the Brain Games song, which we're going to play now. And uh, I just am endlessly overjoyed to have him in our community and thankful and grateful for you and grateful for all of you. So until we speak again, take good care. Light that candle large and pass it on. Keep that gift in circulation. Be the gift and be the ocean. Talk to you soon. And until we speak again, keep yourself magnetic. And now, brain games. Brain games. Brain games. Let the games begin!
I define, establish, exercise, and practice. Externalize spatial maps as I attack the path of mature learner. Bottle burner, max memory reserve, and earnest. I'm a furnace, an anomaly. Sibling, Sibling of Simonides known to reduce cognitive, cognitive load. And oh, how I rotate, juggling space, making a case for brain games. So digital amnesia leaves you digital dementia is censured. Did y'all tag heredium on your mind wall? Review, recall, we will evolve. Brain games, synapses flashing, mind palace crashing with brain games. Info encoded, mental high roller. Brain games, synapses flashing, mind palace crashing with the brain games. Info encoded, mental high roller. This is not a game you can afford to lose. <gasps> Why? Brain games, don't need an app for that I just attack with the path of a lab rat I mean scientist, I'm an annihilist Finalist, illuminist, numinous Doing this, proving this, who is this scholar? Dopamine fiend, clean sheen like the Pleiades Enemies, ill at ease, killing with abilities Rolling with affinity, rolling with McKinney Brain games, healthy snacks Build a palace, pick some facts Learn to balance while you rap Unleash talents, don't look back Brain games, synapses flashing Mind palace crashing with the brain games Info encoded, mental high roll Brain game, synapses flashing, my palace crashing with the brain game. Info encoded, mental high roller. <laughs>